It's marvellous to see you all coming out here in your thousands to Dr. Kramer's talk, History of Astronomy. And he's just been telling me that he's very excited being here because he's also worked a bit on women's contribution to this. So without a delay, let's welcome Dr. Kramer to the floor. Thank you, Dr. Kramer. Excellent. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here. I'm really enjoying this cruise so far. I hope you all are too. We're going to talk about the history of astronomy today. Uh, naturally, I can't do it justice in uh, the brief amount of time we have here, but at least we'll cover some interesting facts. A little bit more on self-introduction. Uh, the first bullet is very important. I am retired, and I'm really enjoying it. It's fabulous. And for those of you that aren't retired yet, who's not retired? Show of hands. You're missing something. I'm sorry to say. Uh, the rest of the things I'll cover in subsequent talks, I don't want to talk about too much of myself. Uh, so, astronomy is really the oldest science that we have. It goes back thousands of years. Uh, the roots of astronomy are left to us in some monuments that we find around the world. And We've got monuments that date back as far as 3000 BC. I mean, this far predates any biology or physics or chemistry. So it is the oldest science that we have. And you'll see some of this as you go along. Stonehenge, of course, everybody is familiar with the summer solstice at Stonehenge. There are other alignments with Stonehenge, uh, shown over on the diagram uh, on the right. And I know that one's a little bit hard to understand because it's not very really clear. But there are different star risings that are, are found in this structure. And that one dates back to uh, 3000 BC up to 1800 BC. We don't know exactly how old Stonehenge is. Stonehenge remains to be a mystery today. I remember visiting Stonehenge with my wife some years ago, and we took the tour, and we took the audio tour, and we were listening to it, and we're hoping, yes, there's going to be an explanation of what Stonehenge is. Well, there's lots of theories, but they actually apologize at the end and say they don't know what it is. <laughs> but now, it's not until we get to the ancient Greeks that we start getting writings concerning astronomy. The ancient Greeks are the first that we have writings that are preserved from their culture, and they did describe the motions of the stars and planets in terms of mathematical models. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, as you'll see, most of their models were wrong. Um, this is because they used obvious first principles. Let me give you an example of an obvious first principle that was clear and uh, succinct to them. For example, if you take an object and drop it, then the thinking of the time in, in the Greeks, because of course they didn't understand anything about gravity, was it's clear that the object is dropping to the center of the universe. So clearly the Earth is at the center of the universe, and the center is somewhere beneath our feet. Now, this was a wrong assumption, but all their theories are then based on this wrong assumption. And surprisingly, that wrong assumption lasted for a very long time, and it actually worked. <laughs> then we come to the Dark Ages. And science really didn't progress much in the Dark Ages. Well, actually, it's not as dark as you think. It's pretty much gray. There were some isolated pockets there. So, for example, here in the 14th century, the Bishop of Luzon advanced the theory that the Earth moves and not the heavens. But then in the next paragraph we have here, and this is probably because of peer pressure, and I'll read it to you, everyone maintains, and I think myself, that the heavens do move and not the earth. For God hath established the world which shall not be moved. So while he did advance the theory that it did move, publicly he said it didn't. <laughs> uh, then we have the Cardinal of Cusa. He also suggested that the earth revolve around the sun and that each star itself is a distant sun. But he was a voice in the wilderness and nobody was listening. You will see examples of other voices in the wilderness as we, as we progress. Now we come to Copernicus. So here's one of them. <clears throat> so here's Jupiter with some of the moons. And here's Saturn with its well-known rings. And this is actually what you saw through the telescope. So you see Jupiter there in the center and the little white dots next to them. And those are the Jupiter moons and they move. 
time, and here's Saturn, and that was what he was able to see through his telescope. He was actually able to see the rings in his telescope. He was also able to look at the moon and look at structure on the moon. Using the shadows from the mountains, he was able to determine how high some of those mountains were, and that was the first estimate of mountains on the moon. This was a major discovery for him. Uh, he saw sunspots on the sun. The sun, of course, theologically speaking, was perfect and should have no blemishes whatsoever. The fact that it had sunspots, had blemishes, means it wasn't perfect. And this was a blow to the church. And here is a larger <coughs> picture of the sunspot. He also discovered the phases of Venus. I have a couple of pictures to show you here. So under the Ptolemy model, the old model, the Earth is the center and everything is going around the Earth. Under the Copernicus system here, the Sun is at the center and everything is going around the Sun. On the left-hand diagram, there are very limited phases. They're all crescents. In the right-hand diagram, you see many more. And in fact, the next picture shows it much more clearly. So under the Ptolemaic system, you see those are the only shapes that you can get. The Venus, if it's revolving around the Earth. But if the Sun is at the center of our solar system, then you see all of these shapes, and that is exactly what was observed. So another support for the Copernican system. Brahe comes next, 1546 to 1601. He compiled the most accurate eye observations ever made for planetary positions. He was able to make eye measurements to 1 60th of a degree. Last time I gave this talk, I didn't explain this very well. 1 60th of a degree. Take your hand, hold your thumb up. Right, thumbs up everybody. Now turn your thumb sideways. And the thickness of your nail is one sixtieth of a degree. He was making measurements to one sixtieth of a degree by eye. That's pretty phenomenal. Then we get to Newton. And I'm going to stop at Newton. Uh, I know there are other astronomers and I'll refer to them when we get to the next part. But I'm going to stop at Newton. What Newton did was added the physics to astronomy. He invented calculus along with Leibniz. He developed his three laws of motion, which we'll go through very quickly, and he developed the universal law of neutral gravitation, which we'll go through very quickly. All right, first law. An object keeps moving in uniform motion unless there's an external force against it. So if you're in space, you keep going in a straight line. You don't slow down. Anybody seen the film Gravity? Brilliant. Very good description of how things move in space. Second law of motion, force equals mass times acceleration. This is an important concept for determining acceleration due to gravity. We won't go into that in any detail here. Then the third law, which really explains why rockets work. You've got the fuel being pushed out the back end, and because there's an equal and opposite reaction to any force, you've got the rocket moving forward in the other direction. So that's why rockets work. Newton's third law. Then we have the law of gravity, and this is the equation. And there's the idea that it was in fact an apple dropping on his head that gave him the idea. Actually, the current thinking is now, and this may be a surprise to you, Newton was an alchemist. And it is thought that his alchemist studies led to the law of gravitation and his other, his other uh, mathematical discoveries. Now I want to turn to women and astronomy. How are we doing for time? All right. Good, good, good. Women and astronomy, this is fascinating. Well, we go way back, first of all. Uh, we have an account of Agnes of Thessaly in Greece, 200 BC. She's mentioned in different writings. And this, by the way, is how we know about things in the past. Somebody's written about them, or we have writings by them. In many cases, we don't actually have the writings by the originator. We'll have an account of what they did, and that has survived, because we've lost a lot over the years, unfortunately. <coughs> but nonetheless, she was thought of as a sorceress, because she could make the moon disappear from the sky. <laughs> now, what does that mean, make the moon disappear from the sky? What we think it means is she could predict an eclipse. 
So there we go. There's the first female astronomer. She could predict a, a lunar eclipse. Hildegard, another voice in the wilderness. She was uh, Saint Hildegard of Bingen. Uh, you can see there around about 1000 AD, 1100 AD. She actually proposed a heliocentric universe 300 years before Copernicus and his revolution. She also wrote of the universe of gravitation 500 years before Newton. But nobody was listening, unfortunately. She's also credited with uh, writing things in a secret language, and this is the script that she used uh, to write her thoughts. Now we get to Pickering's computers. I'll read this to you. It's implied, these women. These women are capable of doing as much good routine work as astronomers who would receive much larger salaries. Three or four times as many as assistant, assistants can be thus employed, and the work done correspondingly increased for a given expenditure. Edward Pickering. So these are his computers. What he didn't say in here, too, is the women that he employed actually did a better job than the men. They were more meticulous, uh, much more precise. Now some of the... Then we get to Vera Rubin. And Vera Rubin is probably the cause of today's astronomy's problems, as I will explain when we get to it. So, in the 1970s, she calculated that galaxies must have what we now understand as dark matter. And I'll show you why in just a second. Uh, another interesting discovery she made there, I've listed, uh, she looked at a galaxy, NGC 4550, in which half the stars were going in one direction, and half the stars were going in the other direction. So what does that mean? She was looking at two galaxies that had collided, and this is the result of the collision. One galaxy was going this way during the collision. One galaxy was going that way during the collision. And if you want to wait around for about four billion years, you can see it firsthand. There's a drop Andromeda's coming towards us, and we're going to collide. But that's a talk for another day. <laughs> OK, galaxy rotation. And over on the left is what you'd expect to see. <coughs> That the galaxy rotation, as you move out from the center of the galaxy, the stars go slower. But over on the right is what we actually see. The stars over uh, on the outside, I'll run that again. The stars on the edge of the galaxy are rotating much faster than uh, we believe. We, we believe they should have done under the old theory. So here, if you see a velocity profile, it goes down as you get out from the center of the galaxy, and over on the other side, you'll see it remains more or less constant. The only way that can happen is if there's something around the galaxy gravitationally accelerating those stars on the outside. We don't know what dark matter is. There is research that's going on now trying to find out. You may have also heard of the term dark energy. We don't know what that is either. So, in astronomy, despite the fact it is the oldest science and it's been studied for thousands of years and we have overcome some of the wrong assumptions that we've made along the way, it's now become one of the sciences that is the least understood when you consider this statement by Hero Rubin. Here, some of that radiation. Now, I have a sound clip so that you can see, or rather hear, what a rapidly rotating neutron star sounds like. Right, clicking. It's, it's going fairly slowly for some neutron stars. Now this one's going faster. Faster still. And this one's really going. Where you get a whole range at the end of a very brief history of astronomy.
If you have any questions, I'd love to entertain them now. Um, I don't know if you saw the, the little video clip I did on TV. If you see me walking around the ship, sitting down, having coffee, having a bite to eat, then please, you know, come up and see me and we'll have a chat. And, uh, hopefully I'll make your day and you'll make my day with some interesting questions. Okay, gentlemen here. Um, you went by your uh, bio.